Oh, thanks, John. Uh, my name is Jim Adler. I'm, uh, I'm with Metanautics. We're a big data analytics startup. I run products, chief privacy officer there. Uh, so we're going to drop down a little bit on the technology uh, that is, uh, surrounds big data and powers big data. Uh, we were founded uh, about three years ago. Um, come on. <coughs> There we go. By uh, Theo Vasilakis and Terry Leos. Uh, Theo ran the big data team at Google. Uh, the, uh, if you're familiar with BigQuery, uh, which is uh, came out of the Dremel system, uh, Theo uh, left uh, Google to actually bring that technology to the enterprise. Terry Leos built the uh, image engine at Facebook, uh, 300 billion images. Uh, these guys are steeped in big data, best in the world in, in this technology. Uh, the key is actually making it work in the small and in the large, because everyone doesn't have huge data. Sometimes they're very, have very small data, but it tends to grow over time, especially when you're a young company. What used to work in your small relational database system now needs to run in larger and larger and larger infrastructure. And so uh, we were, like I said, founded around three years ago. We have customers came out at General, uh, our product Quest came out in general availability last September. We have University of Chicago, HP, Shutterfly, among other customers, uh, focused on big, uh, uh, big enterprises. Uh, we tend to be really tough problems that are either in, in one of three flavors, either uh, batch, ad hoc, or, or in memory applications that need to run fast at scale. Uh, and I'm going to talk about about that more in a, in a bit when we get into the demo. But if you look at any big data analytics problem, it tends to span across this space from storage to gather data, doing batch jobs, to doing ad hoc analysis, to generating some sort of visualization uh, or through some uh, in-memory uh, uh, user interface. Where we tend to focus is in that middle part where we, you need to gather data through batch jobs, do analysis ad hoc or share data uh, for user interface. We tend not to do storage and we don't do visualization. Why? We are not data lakers. We don't believe that you need to take all your data out and put it in a data lake somewhere. We believe quite strongly that data is in silos and data are going to continue to be in silos because silos is, are, is where data finds its accountability, finds its compliance, finds its focus, and finds its mission. And what any data analytics tool has to do and platform needs to do is actually integrate those silos when appropriate to do the to do the analysis that needs to get done. So we have this product called Metanox Quest. It does three things. It connects these data silos. It uses standard SQL. We're sort of maniacal about that because SQL is really declarative. It doesn't tell the system how to do a computation, you just tell it what you want done. And I'm going to get into that in some detail. Uh, and then we are end to end. You can run from across any set of data uh, all the way into uh, a visualization system like Tableau, who we're uh, partners with, or Excel, or uh, Click, or any other sort of visualization system. So. When you look at the ecosystem, there's all kinds of data out there. There's logs, there's web, there's documents, there's mobile, uh, there's social, uh, there's all kinds of data shapes. There's flat relational data. There's also nested repeated NoSQL data. Uh, there's uh, data in relational databases and file systems. It's all over the place. How do you bring it together in a cohesive, scalable way? Well, we're going to talk about that right now. So this is Metanautics Quest, and we're going to run some SQL queries tonight. I, I know that you were looking forward to that. Uh, uh, but we're going, to, you know, we're going to just sort of take a very small amount of data and show what's possible. Uh, so we'll do some basic analysis. We'll link to some uh, foreign data tables. We'll do some logical views. We'll take some snapshots, all in about five minutes. Uh, so if you look at typical analysis, like if you look at uh, rev a revenue, uh, table, it tends to look like something like this. You have some country, you have some revenue, you have some SKUs that are, looks like they're cut off. Uh, and you want to an analyze that data. T typically you want to group it by country or group it by SKU. And so what you t tend to do in Metanox Quest, we pull data or we connect right to Tableau as I said, and we're connected to those data tables in Quest. And you can just take uh, the revenue and you can take the country and Tableau will just do the, the group buys for you. Uh, now this is running on a small amount of data on my, my laptop. It can also run on thousands of servers and billions of rows of data with effectively the same query, select star from revenue table. 
Doesn't matter. Could be a billion row table, could be a five row table. Doesn't matter. SQL's declarative. You don't say how the system should do it, you just tell it. Give me all the rows in the table. Now if you want to do something a little more sophisticated, you can group by country. So we got France, UK, US, and Germany. Here's the sum of the revenue. Uh, Sometimes you have a CSV file that you just want to connect to. We have this idea called a foreign table that you can connect to. This table actually lives in a, in a file somewhere. It's called revenue by country. It's on the file system. And we just connect to it. And then we can query it. Then we just query it. Now we're not moving the data. We're just connecting to that data silo. Okay? And there's the data. Uh, again, we can do our revenue by SKU by country on that foreign table, that, uh, that CSV file. Uh, and then we can do things like logical views. Say you want to change the data a little bit, you want to rename a column, like what we're doing here. We're changing from country to capital, title case, we're changing revenue to total revenue. We're, we're filtering out France, who would want to filter out France. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you can actually look at, uh, and then we just created that view, and then you can just query that logical view, just like it was a table. <coughs> And you can see that we just have the roll up again, uh, or the, the group by, by, by country again, sans France. So what, the, what a logical view lets you do is reshape the data and, uh, and, and bring it into the same kind of analysis tools that you're used to. Uh, what you also, sometimes you do, want, you do want to take table snapshots. You do want to take some data and you want to move it. With the same kind of constructs, we can do this with SQL. You can do create a table and create it as the, uh, a SQL query. And now we're going to just put it in the local file system. And so we're going to store this table locally. Here's the table. It's our, our group by country. Uh, and it's just going to store it in this file on the file system. Sometimes what you want to do, you want to throw it into S3. And with the same exact uh, uh, construct, you can actually, with this different location, instead of writing it to the file system, we're going to write it into S3. With really just tell me where to put it. Same exact query. The same one there as was here, except the one, only difference here is that that's going to the file system, and this one's going to Amazon. Okay. Uh, you can also bring in, table from, bring in data from MySQL. Here's a foreign table we're creating out of a MySQL table or MySQL database that lives somewhere in the file system. We want to exclude some data. Uh, if you look at this piece of uh, data, it's, it's cities and countries. And we want to just pull out, maybe we just want to pull out data that's not on the continent. So we want to distinct that table. And so that just gives us France and Germany, pulls out the cities. And then what we want to do is we want to combine our excluded countries and the report we just ran, and we want to write it out onto the file system. And so you do that in one, two queries, and there it is. It's now written out onto the file system. Now what you want to do is you want to create a pipeline of that because you want to run this thing without writing all this SQL every time because maybe your group actually feeds a finance group and you want the finance group just to run this pipeline. So we have this idea called pipelines. And you can see this is the exact same query I just ran. It just creates that, uh, that aggregate. Uh, that excludes uh, the, uh, the, the continental countries. But now all you, you got to do is call it with this, run my finance report, my, finan my finance export. And same idea, and it just runs. <laughs> okay? The last thing you want to do is sometimes you want to create a user-defined function because SQL doesn't do everything. You want to send a mail out. See, Quest supports a user-defined function. You can send mail out in, in, in Python, and you just call it like this. Select send mail, from, to, and the body. And then finally what you want to do is you want to run the pipeline we defined up there, up here. You want to run it every morning at 9 a.m. because that's when you got to run your financial reports. So you run this pipeline called, remember, run my finance export. You want to send a mail to the team when it's done. You want to send it out every day and you want to send it out at 1300, which is 9 a.m. Eastern Time. So the th that's basically how this system works. This works on five row tables or billion row tables. The SQL doesn't change at all. Uh, to finish up, We're actually taking personal, or we're releasing what's called, what we're calling Personal Quest, which is a small version of Quest that's yours to use for as long as you like. 
Uh, it's got some restrictions around the data sizes, but it, it's fully featured in the sequel. Uh, it runs on your laptop, uh, runs in a, a VMware virtual image, and it gives you the opportunity to connect to these data sources, see what's possible, run what I ran here tonight. We're gonna, if you want to be in, involved in the early access program, uh, my email is uh, here. Uh, feel free to drop me a note, grab a card. Uh, we are also hiring. Uh, we're a Sequoia Capital Back company. Uh, so if you love data, you love analysis, uh, you want to integrate data supply chains, please talk to me. Thanks. <laughs> we have time for questions, John? Anybody? I answered all your questions. <laughs> all right, totally lost you. Yes, sir. <laughs> So for us, Hadoop is really two pieces. It's a storage layer, distributed storage layer, and it's a compute layer. So we connect to Hadoop because it's a great storage layer. People are putting a ton of data into it as a data lake. And then we have connectors, just like you saw us connect to MySQL. We have an HDFS colon slash slash connect to my Hadoop. And then we could just connect to Hadoop just as easy as we connect to a CSV file or as easy as we connect to a relational database. And you created that, that data store the same way that through SQL or, or That's right, just through sweet SQL. So for us, it's just another data silo that we can that we can bring in. Yes, sir. Can you expose the data in JSON or XML? Number one. Number two, can you use HTTPS if you need to open this publicly? Yeah, absolutely. So HTTPS, everything is HTTPS. We're, you know, we're, I'm a privacy guy. Uh, we, we're very focused on security. You know, 95%, although everyone says they're in the cloud, 95% of data is behind the firewall. And so security compliance is very important. On your question around XML and JSON, we have nested repeated data built from the ground up, which is JSON and XML. We're a MongoDB partner. Uh, so we have built, in fact, uh, when Theo worked at Google, they built nested repeated data in, because the whole idea is that nested repeated JSON data was supposed to be sort of the new thing. Well, it turns out the new thing is really integrating with the old thing. So the old thing is SQL, relational, flat. The new thing is NoSQL, JSON, nested, repeated. And, but they have to come together, because you have to connect them. You have to do analysis across them. And Quest supports both natively. Yes, sir. Uh, so it seems like you're getting a lot of usability gains out of sort of abstracting away all these different data sources behind a kind of common SQL interface. Um, how do users, do users have to think about performance or sort of like this abstraction uh, accessing a data source in a way that's sort of suboptimal or other ways to tune it? How, how do you guys think it's, about It's that? highly optimal. So, uh, so the, ho the whole idea is that when, when users tend to get their fingers dirty trying to optimize, they seldom succeed. Or if they do succeed, it's for a very narrow application. And so the beauty of SQL, it's declarative. A as I said, it tells the system what you want to do, but not how it should do it. So, for example, uh, we have customers where they'll come in, and uh, University of Chicago's in this camp. They were running uh, economic analysis of uh, uh, electricity market transactions. It was taking them two days to run uh, some of these, these regressions. We ran on Quest in about a minute and a half on the same hardware. So it's amazingly performant. Uh, so even on virtual hardware, so on, even on virtualized hardware, which they say, oh, there's a 10% tax. Well, when you're talking about 1,000 times better, two days to a couple minutes, you can, you can deal with the 10%. <laughs> yes, sir. Where are your target customers? So we are looking at folks that have large, large, e either large data or actually, not necessarily large data, but data spread across the organization. So, uh, so we have uh, 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 consumer packaged goods, we have energy, uh, we have software, tech, uh, across the board in, in, uh, in our customer portfolio right now. So there's uh, anyone who's got data, and then a lot of the data is sitting dormant because they can't get at it because they have to go through a 18 month, two year ETL uh, extract transform load process to pull it out so they can use it. We just have a connector that'll just go and, and access it usually in place. And if not, we just do a create table as and pull it, pull it into Quest because uh, Quest has a, has a uh, storage layer if you want to snapshot the data. Yes, sir. How do you, how do you uh, so I love the idea of grabbing the, the data from different storages, uh, from different silos, but how do you uh, deal with conflicts where people are trying to uh, look at the same data but in two different ways? So I come from the banking business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody who tech out of the markets is looking at the issuer side and I attribute one revenue to the issuers, somebody from the sales and trading side might take that same revenue yeah. 
and put it to a whole different mindset. So it's really a data governance issue you're, you're touching on. So uh, you'll often have, the, the, the most egregious example of this is you have the, the same report or a similar report that has the same number, or that's supposed to have the same numbers and don't, right? right? And you're like, uh, what happened? And so, the, so we, we, Quest supports the, uh, a set of information schema lineage tables, so we know who queried what data when, and we can walk back every query from the original data source all the way through the pipeline, so you can actually know, not just that the end result was this, uh, report that is in isolation, but you know the exact lineage of where every single query and every piece of data came from to build up that report. So you at least have the raw uh, material to basically walk these things back. And we have in one of our uh, Tableau workbooks at what we're calling State of My Quest, where you have all the tables, all the queries, and you can actually start to look at, and I could, we could talk afterward, I could show you an example of that, of how you can actually get your arms around the data governance problem. Because the good thing about where Quest sits is since we're querying the data in the silos, we know where the queries uh, ran, what data they accessed, and we are logging all that data so then we can put together uh, the Humpty Dumpty, <laughs> which is often uh, impossible. How am I doing on time, Sean? One more. Anybody? Yes, sir. Can you tell me a bit more, how well can you support simulations? Because right now it's all about what if, and if the big stress happens, or if this happens. So like simulation scenario analysis? Yeah, uh, so you know, we think we're very strong there only because we can scale. So what tends to happen with simulations is you tend to, you, you, you need, and I used to run, I used to uh, be a rocket engineer many, many years ago, and we used to run uh, Six Degree of Freedom uh, simulations all the time. Uh, everything had a fit in memory. So what you, what you end up having to do often is sample and then run your simulations, but you can't run it necessarily on all the data. So you find a statistically significant, hopefully, uh, sample of data, but when you have skewed distributions, that could really uh, mess up your, uh, your results. With SQL, you don't have to sample the data. In fact, we, if there's a blog post uh, that I wrote on our site that talks about using k-means clustering on all your data. So whether, it doesn't, all your data doesn't have to fit in memory anymore because the algorithm is running in a sharded, uh, distributed fashion, and your simulation can too. Uh, Quest takes care of all the sharding, all the distribution. You write your algorithm. Sometimes it's R within that user-defined function. So in that user-defined function, I was sending mail. But you can actually run an iteration of your simulation in an R routine in a user-defined function. So we'll shard the data. Your user-defined function will get a slice of that data and then aggregate it in an in a outer query that will bring it all together. So the days of sampling and hoping your distribution supports those assumptions are, are fading. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.